Red Simons is with me in the studio now. Um, it's a little over two weeks since his son Samuel died, age 27. Samuel was reported as being a very active uh, worker in the area of uh, uh, of cancer and kids with cancer. Um, close to my heart, my family. Remember, my family works in that area as well. Um, just a few ground rules here. We've had a lot of messages and letters for Red, which we're passing on. I don't want to take calls on this issue. I, I think that's too personal and too intrusive. So we'll discuss it. Red will uh, say what he need, wants to say, and then we'll take a break and move on to the other issues. So uh, we, we, we really, I think that's the, the decent and the proper way to handle it. Red Simons, thanks for coming in. Uh, thank you, Neil. You, you were the person who... Let, let the news out into the world that Samuel had died and you did it with grace, dignity and constraint and I thank you very much for that. It's kind of a simple thing. Um, it's <laughs> one of the ironies of the situation is having spent most of my life making sure that complete and utter strangers recognise me in the street I have received condolences from complete and utter strangers, which overwhelm me with, obviously, grief um, and sincere thanks to them, to anybody who feels that. Um, it's sort of been a long haul with Samuel. Um, Four years old when he's diagnosed? Yes, that was with the original glioma, and then there was a meningioma seven or eight years, five years maybe after that, and then there was uh, th thyroidectomy uh, four or five years after that, and the original one came back this time. Uh, the rituals are all performed. We've been to the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, the, a eulogy isn't part of the ritual in a Greek Orthodox Church, um, so I'm going to use you <laughs> to make the eulogy. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, Samuel, I have always loved you. I will always love you. I shall always have you. Just that. Nothing more. Can you tell us a bit about him? He was, he was remarkable in his own way uh, in that, um, you know, at four years old, you sort of come to terms with the fact that he's not going to be here. Uh, 20 years later... He's got a master's degree from Mel. He was the most qualified person in the family. And part of the treatment, one of the dangers is that it can inhibit your intellect. Um, he must have started pretty high to, to do as well as he did. Um, his legacy, there's a question. Um, I sort of used to have a an ironic observation, which is simply a truth, that there's no better place in the world to get sick than Melbourne, Australia. And he is living, non-living, uh, evidence of that, because if he'd had what he had 50 years, 20 years earlier, he wouldn't have passed and lasted past four. And the continuing treatments that he had, thank you to the Children's Hospital, the Royal Melbourne the Peter Mac uh, for doing what you just simply do. Thank you. He, on what I read, gave a lot back. He did. Well, it was part, it was part of his character, you know. Uh, ooh, now, here's a story. I crossed the line with Samuel, um, which in some cultures is not something that you do. I asked him, how do you feel about death? How old was he? Uh, this is when death was looming uh, two or three weeks before he died. And he said, I don't worry about death because it's been part of my life. And I think, in a way, that's really the nature of his involvement with the Peter Mac and, and the hospital. That this is, this is, he was accustomed to it and comfortable there. He knew it and he knew what to do. He knew what they would do and... Um, once again, I, I thank the professors and the doctors and the nurses. <sighs> one last thing. <laughs> I have a friend who has a concept called one downmanship, um, which is if I say to you, oh, I stubbed my toe, Neil. You say, you stubbed your toe? Let me tell you what happened to me. And I have experienced this. Uh, a dear friend 
um, who I've known for 30 years, his mother died. And I learnt this from his wife, who I bumped into, and she, I grieved with her uh, for the mother, and then she apologised for, she said, but you've been through, what, with what you've been through, what I've been through is no, no, no trivial. I said, no, it's not a competition. You know, you experience your grief completely, uh, and I know how I feel my grief. It's not a competition to be the winner. To briefly invert that and bring it back to happy thoughts, there was a sort of gag floating around years ago about how it would be good to walk on the moon, to be an astronaut who had walked on the moon. Because you find yourself at a dinner party Mm. and uh, you just quietly, you know, with all the gentlemen and ladies at this dinner party and uh, somebody at the dinner party spoke says, uh, (laughs) ladies, I just... uh, just bought a Maserati. Oh, and they're so excited. And he's the focus of, of attention. And you, the person who's walked on the moon, just very quietly say, hmm, that's interesting. I've walked on the moon. <laughs> that's one upmanship. <laughs> we'll take a break. <laughs> 